Welcome to A Course in Miracles. We're doing chapter six tonight, um, and we did chapter six, one to four last week. So we continue from, from chapter 6.5, and it is called The Only Answer. And again, this, I remind you that this course is, is addressing you, the self, this holy son of God, the fractured part of the son of God, which is presented as an individual body, mind, you. But the very essence of you is the self, the observer. And or another word for the observer is the decision maker. And that decision maker has a, an, as two options. You choose the ego mind, which is the fallen asleep secret mind, the mind of the ego, which, by the way, you've made yourself and then pushed it away from yourself, not realizing it is actually you. Or you get to choose for the mind, which is led by the awake part of the dreamer, which is called the Christ mind or the Holy Spirit mind. And what you're really asked to do is to put or to give authority to the right mind, the Holy Spirit mind. You're thinking you have a choice between wrong mind and right mind. A choice for wrong mind is a choice for nothing. And so there's only one choice. And, and that is to, to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which I'll explain what is it. What is the Holy Spirit? Is it a being that we're following it? Is it a voice? Is it an entity that God has sent into the no, it's Simply God spoke into the son's dream and it's his voice, his holy voice, his holy spirit, because God is spirit. So it's his holy, there's no voice as such. It's symbolic. His holy spirit flowing into the dream. And what is the spirit? It's the roadmap. It's the memory of how we return to the remembrance of what we are. And so it starts off with a very clever line says, remember that the Holy Spirit is the answer, not the question. So answer to what? Well, it's the answer to every question you have. Um, and, if, and again, if every time I say the word Holy Spirit, you were to silently say to yourself, the memory of God. So if I read that line and I said, remember that the memory of God is the answer, not the question, that makes perfect sense. Because the memory of God is the memory of you, God's son. And so you, not as in you individual, but you as collective, all of us as the dreamer that is projected into this dream. So the memory of God is the answer, not the question. Always remember this, especially when you wake up after having deep sleep. In the morning, you'll hear those attack thoughts, they come. And as you wake up, the ego immediately tries to, you know, reassert its you identity and it brings up the conflict thoughts. It brings up something that happened the previous day, something that you've done, not done. It's either guilt or attack. Attack the world, or you've been a victim of the world, and therefore you either feel guilt or you're being attacked. So the ego always speaks first. It is capricious and does not mean it's maker well. And there's the alluding. You made it. You made the ego. It believes and correctly that it's maker may withdraw his support from it at any moment, which is 100% correct. You, its maker, can withdraw your support from it at any moment. If it meant you well, it would be glad, as the Holy Spirit will be glad, the memory of God will be glad, when he has brought you home and you no longer need his guidance. And why would you no longer need the guidance? Well, once you've gone on a road trip, you can put down the map because it's brought you to where you want to end up. The ego this is, the, this is the phenomenal part and, and why we're so trapped in the delusion of, of duality. The ego does not regard itself as a part of you, yet tries to convince you you are it. How absurd, to say the least. So then what is the ego? Is it something outside you? And you can understand if you'd believed the fact that the ego does not regard itself as a part of you, and yet you were to believe in the ego, you now can understand where the idea of an external demon, Satan, devil comes from. Because then it's something outside you trying to attack your sovereignty, which is impossible anyway, since your true sovereignty is there's the Holy Son of God, one with your brotherhood in God as the kingdom. 
And herein lies its primal error, primary error, the foundation of its whole thought system is the ego's primal error. When God created you, he made you part of him, not a part of him, part of him. That is why attack within the kingdom is impossible because it's an extension of God. You made the ego without love. Now, let me stop there for a second. And again, you'll see, you'll hear this. Many so-called spiritual person loves to romanticize about how the world is so beautiful and how God created the mountains and everything's just so wonderful and nature so wonderful and animals are so wonderful. Well, you know, take a piece of the forest or the jungle or the African bush and look closely what's going on there. Something's killing something and something's eating something, in other words, for something to live. This world is capricious. It's vicious. It's kill or be killed. This is not made in love. Don't tell me that. A gazelle is okay with a lion ripping its guts out and eating it while it's still breathing. The whole thing is just sickening because love has no need, not even thought about killing anything in order to survive. The idea of survival in itself is egoic. So everything in this entire universe, if there's a thousand meteors heading our way and bouncing off our whatever, um, Everything is designed to kill you. Everything. So when I smoke a cigarette, don't move into judgment. Everything is designed to kill you. And that's the way the ego is because it lives on through the misery of others and the sadness of others when you should die just as you feel sad when other people die, which is why you shouldn't feel sad because feeling sad is giving your allegiance to an ego. It means if you feel sad when someone died, you don't understand death does not exist and life is a continuum. So you made the ego without love, and so it does not love you. It cannot love you. So what is your ego? Is it something outside you? No, it's your body mind. That, touch that. That's your ego. Touch that. That's your ego. Your words, your thoughts, your eyesight, your ears, all of it. Your identification with your role, the world you see is your ego. That is it. It's not some esoteric spirit floaty floaty around popping into your head to to tempt you to do something like the devil made me do it nonsense everything you can touch feel see everything you can touch feel see is ego now part of that ego doesn't have an active attack thought system it just present but the ego then plays out through instinct so let's take your beautiful little kitten, meow, meow. Put a grasshopper in front of it, see what happens. Your beautiful little dog, you know, that grows up into a fully, you know, fully grown American Staffordshire Terrier. Put a cute little duck in front of it, see what happens. Instinct to kill, oh, it's natural. It's natural ego. <laughs> it's all ego. Look closely and you will know that what you look upon is not and can never have made, been made in love. How could we ever have thought God made this world? How could we ever have thought God made this universe? The swirling masses of gases and burning suns that just want to devour everything in its path. We have the loonies that say, oh, multiple universes. Well, how do you know there's a multiple universe? Deduct through what? You can deduct as long as you want to. There's no proof. We can't even prove where the edge of the universe ends. We can speculate and the mathematicians make assumptions. No proof. We haven't even been outside our galaxy yet. So it's just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Don't buy into any of that nonsense, especially the spiritual nonsense. Okay? And this is important. This line is vital. Let me highlight it in a different color. Let's go purple because it's spiritual. Ooh, purple spiritual. <laughs> Stop it, Lurge. <laughs> you could not remain within the kingdom without love. And since the kingdom is love, you believe that you are without it. But listen to this line. You could not remain within the kingdom without love. And since you are the love of God and the kingdom is love, how can you be without it? You can't. You just created a dream 
where you pushed yourself into that dream and you think you're in there. And the dream is that which blocks you from awakening. So think about yourself at night when you're stuck in your dream and you're chasing fairies or being chased by dragons. Where are you in your bed asleep? But that dream feels real. And what prevents you from waking up is the dream. And how many times have you been woken up? Rude awakening, alarm goes off, 5 a.m. And you had a lack of dream and you just want to go back to that dream. It was, oh, it was such a nice dream. And that's it. You, this is why we're still here is because the son of God, a part of him, a big part of him, the majority of him, wants to go back to sleep and wants to keep dreaming a fanciful dream where he's, the activities of his dream have some form of romanticized experience of special love and special whatever, and specialness more importantly. And, and now it just really highlights what the ego is. And this enables the ego to regard itself as separate and outside its maker, because you can't remember your source. You can't remember the kingdom. Of course, you can't even remember you are the kingdom. Thus speaking for the part of your mind that believes you are separate and outside the mind of God. Look how it's capitalized M. But you cannot be outside the mind of God because if God is all there is, there's nothing outside God. If God is all there is. And that's why the, the, the Advita Vedanta student can very gently and erroneously make the mistake that the universe is God experiencing himself. Why would that which is want to experience itself in duality? Well, to know itself. That's nonsense. It knows itself. It's the all-knowing. And so it's, it's a tiny little error by Advita Vedanta students, non-dualists, that believe the universe is God wanting to express itself and it's now manifested as bodies. If that's the case, where's the spirit world? Can't see it. But then if you can't see it, why can you see that, not this? It makes no sense because it's nonsensical. It's not rubbish. It's just conceptual theories like things like the Acacia records. Just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. But we like it because it sounds cool. And of course, if we have access to the Acacia records because we're super psychic and we have been in, imbued with spir special spiritual powers making us better than others, then we think we're okay. But I tell you, at the moment that you're about to die, if your belief system isn't fully sounded and founded and grounded in love and the knowing of that, oh, oh I don't want to be you. You know, I've seen it. I've watched so-called highly spiritual people and then they're about to die. And at that moment of death, they are in panic. What if everything they taught everybody is bullshit? Well, it is. And so let's shift our mind to the understanding, understanding that then gets transcended into knowing through not us, we can't do it through God's Holy Spirit. The memory of God in us returns us to full remembrance. The ego then raised the first question that was ever asked, but one it can never answer. Ego can't answer any questions. In actual fact, every question that ego asks leads to more questions. Every solution the ego gives leads to the need for more solutions. It never gives you anything that's final. Every movie you've ever watched where there was a war 2,000 years ago and the good people won, and, and, and now we're still straight back into it. Now it's all about a little prick and maybe we can sell 10 of them and get one for free, but it's all the same nonsense. It's all some external made something, something that's going to kill you. Well, it's all going to kill you, including the little prick. Okay. That question, what are you, was the beginning of doubt. And, and, and what is questions that every spiritual person asks? What are you? And of course, they're going to immediately give you an answer and telling you that you're a spirit in the body. No, you're not. Definitely not. That's the biggest bullshit lie any spiritual person has ever bought into because no one ever sees them. And those that do, they don't believe you. You are spirit projecting a body. You are spirit projecting the entire universe. And then you've projected into it the body. Have you ever wondered if spirit is in the body? When did the soul or the spirit get into the body? At the time of birth, uh, do you know that for a fact? Have you seen it? Cut someone open. Have you ever seen their spirit or soul? because you have no cooking clue what it is. So you make up all these theoretical constructs because they sound romantic, sound, make you sound special. It's all nonsense, rubbish. Spirituality is rubbish. It's just as rubbish as religion. 
And hence, poor little baby Jesus had to come back and disturb crazy little Helen Schuchman and say, hey, write this fucking shit down because no one's listening. It's time to listen. Because we were just on this path to nowhere. And the more spirituality grows because people give up on the dogmatic idea of a vengeful God taught in religion. Spirituality kept growing, but it still had no answers because 90% of it's nonsense. Stare into a crystal ball and tell your future. Read an angel card and predict your future. Your future is determined by you every second you have a thought. If you rely on some psychic medium or psychic at large to tell you what's going to be okay in the future, well, if you believe it, then it'll be okay for you because you believe it, not because the psychic has seen anything, because no one can see anything. And yes, so those of us that are fully present and conscious in awareness and in eternity, not in time, the bigger picture is available to you. So it looks like you're looking into time, future, but you're not because it's always here now. The ego has never answered any question since, although it has raised many, many questions. The most inventive activities of the ego has never done more than obscure the question because you, because you have the answer and the ego is afraid of you. And let's repeat that line again, because you have the answer and the ego is afraid of you. Because you have the answer, the ego is afraid of you. Remember this, you have the answer. I don't have the answer. That's why it's so vital and it's important and it's so fucking important that you remember this, hence the word fuck in that sentence. Don't turn me into your guru. Don't do that to self. Don't make me into something I'm not. I've never claimed to be anything, especially not holy or spiritual. Conscious, definitely. Awake, most definitely. Enlightened doesn't exist. Enlightened is the recognition, the best you can get from enlightenment, the recognition of one being, of one's own being as that self, which is the Holy Son of God. And it's a recognition. Haven't stopped swearing, haven't stopped smoking, haven't stopped racing motorcycles, haven't stopped smiling at pretty girls. Oh, it's not, and then people say, oh, I'm just human. You're not human. Human is just an excuse for being fallible, and you're not. You are infallible. You're uncorruptible, incorruptible. You are that which is the power of the universe. You are that which is the kingdom of God. Every other humanistic example you use, an excuse you use, is an excuse, and you should know this. It's how ego has captured your imagination and captured the concepts that fit in for it, that fill it in that make itself feel worthy, and then you use it, stop. You cannot understand the conflict until you fully understand the basic fact that the ego cannot know anything. Ego knows nothing. The Holy Spirit does not speak first, but he always answers. In other words, if you be still, because he doesn't speak in a voice. If you're hearing voices, go and see a doctor. Psychosis, take some pills. You can't hear the voice of Jesus. You can't hear the voice of God. You will hear the Holy Spirit's voice as your own inner voice. That's it, because it is your own inner voice. Holy Spirit is you. You don't have an ego, but you have a Holy Spirit. Your spirit is holy because the very essence of what you are is made from the essence, which is God. Your essential nature is God's essential nature, which means love peace, joy in our understanding. And love, I mean agape, unconditional, not special love relationships, not amorous love, not desire, definitely not sexual desire. That just ends up in sticky bits and nine months of hassles and then 30 years of hell, 11 minutes of pleasure. Okay, everyone has called upon him for help at one stage or the other, even though if you didn't believe in him and the airplane shook while you were 30,000 feet in the air, Everybody believing in God or not goes, oh, my God. <gasps> okay. So we all call on our Holy Spirit in some way or another and has been answered because prayer is real. Prayer is communion. The prayer is actually, you know, asking prayer is weak prayer, the weakest form of prayer. Okay. If you on a scale of one to a thousand, prayer is five and a half. Okay. Communion is 998. Abiding is a thousand. Since the Holy Spirit answers truly, 
Why? Because it's truth itself. It's the memory of truth. The answers for all time, which means eternity, which means that everyone has the answer now. Now and eternity are the same word. Eternity is not lasting forever. Eternity is always now, here now. This is vital that you get this, and this is why it's so important to, to in, in, in the Bible, he talks about, keeping your lanterns burning, the vigilance for God. And, and when we ask Holy Spirit for help, it's not saying Holy Spirit help and then just backing off. You know, it's like, help, Holy Spirit, please help me to stop smoking cigarettes while you're smoking. <laughs> you know, if you really want to stop, you be vigilant for, for the craving. And then you bring Holy Spirit consciousness into your mind now. If you believe cigarettes are bad for you, of course they're not. Nothing is or everything is. The ego cannot hear the Holy Spirit, never will, okay? because the ego is not true and the Holy Spirit is. But it does believe that part of the mind, that, that, that part of the mind that made it is against it. Okay? It doesn't know what part because it doesn't access it. So ego is afraid of an enemy it cannot see. Ego is afraid of an enemy it cannot know. And if you don't know that something is out to get you, what happens? Fear. So ego is afraid of that which it doesn't know. And what is the human nature? We are afraid of that which we don't know. How does it translate into everyday life? We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of moving. We're afraid of change. Ego is afraid of that which it doesn't know. And since it's aware in some way that it doesn't know, it's aware that there's something more powerful and because every now and again it loses awareness of you as you transcend through prayer or meditation or, or abidance. It's afraid that you're going to let go of it. And now it says, okay, if that's the case, best I keep you trapped in fear. Since I'm afraid of something that could destroy me, let me ensure that you believe that you could be destroyed too. It interprets this as a justification for attacking its maker, you. You are its maker. You are both ego and that which experiences ego. It splits you into two. Why I splits you into two? Because if you know you're holistically trapped in ego mind, then your alternate option is Holy Spirit. And the minute you go Holy Spirit, ego dissolves. And so what does the ego do? It creates the good wolf and the bad wolf, or the good angel, the, the light angel and the dark angel, the white angel and the, and the dark demon. And now these two fight with each other. And this is good and that's bad. And we want to side with the good. Spiritual people want to be good and they don't want to want to be vegans and librarians and vegetarians and and they want to be peace and eat beans and, and chant and wear their grandmother's curtains and dance around a fire and go barefoot and, you know, and just like shuao, love everybody when the moon's out and it's something's retrograde. Well, that bullshit. Stop, okay? It believes that defense is attack, the best form of defense. Hey, what does it do? It tells every young man, let's go and study martial arts. Let's go to the army, the police force, special forces. And what will they teach you in Aikido, Kendo, in those formative martial arts? The best form of defense is attack. I believed it for years. You know, I remember my father saying, if there's a bully standing in front of you, don't wait for him to hit you. Punch him first. Okay, well, I did. Very soon I was feared. And so it believes that the best form of defense is attack and wants you to believe it's true. It wants you to equip yourself with an armory and an arsenal. You know, and so what do spiritual people do? They become harmless. And there's nothing more pathetic than a harmless person. Because harmless means you can't harm what? The very thing that attacks you. And what is attacking you? The ego. You're not meant to wish it away. You're meant to destroy it actively. And how do you actively destroy it? Not by going after it, but by aligning only with the Holy Spirit and then staying vigilant with the shield of light awareness and saying no to any attack thought. You're not defending against it. You're just saying no, not interested, not buying into it, not diving into it, not going into the drama. Unless you do believe it, you will not side with it. Unless you do believe with it, you will not side with it. And the ego feels badly in need of allies, though not of brothers. Why allies? Because Enemy of my enemy is my enemy. But once I've conquered the enemy, I don't need you anymore. I might actually turn on you. 
perceiving something alien to itself in your mind, not aware of it, perceiving it. It's not aware of it. It doesn't say aware of something. It perceives it. it it's imagining something alien to itself in your mind. The ego turns to the body as its ally. Now, all of you that suffer physical ailments, that get sick, you're worried about body pains, disease, sickness, illness, here it is. Perceiving something. So when you've been stuck in ego, when you've been beating yourself up, when you've been rejecting yourself, when you've been finding yourself unworthy and why is this done to me and the victim of the world and, and carrying the burden of the world and carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, it's going to play out through your body. Why? Because the ego says, yeah, isn't perfect opportunity to attack. It knows it, that you are starting to done the course of miracles. You're going, you're siding with non-duality. You're siding with Holy Spirit. It knows it's, you're starting to let go of your allegiance to people, places, things, and one, and events. You no longer desire the intensity that you once desired to acquire, to conquer, to be something special. It's aware. It's losing you. So what does it do? It says, okay, this thing you've made, which is an identity, ego, and it's identity projected, body, mind, I will side with that and attack you. But how does it attack you if you are that which projects it? It makes you believe that it's outside you. And so the concept of soul inside a body, it's now the body attacking soul. But hang a second. If you are soul projecting body, what's attacking you? Just a silly, tiny, mad idea that doesn't actually happen. That actually isn't true unless you believe in it. And so perceiving something alien to itself in your mind, the ego turns to the body as its ally because the body is not a part of you. You're not a body. You're free. You're still as God created. you. The body is not you. And woe be to that person, the vanity, the body vanity, the muscles or the beauty queen and the hair and the makeup and the changing the hair 600 times, which just shows a psychosis, okay? And I'm sorry if you're offended, but that's the fact because you're then trying to change the body all the time, make it younger, slimmer, longevity, health, health, what health, you know? And all the stuff that you plaster on your, you know? And, um, and the next thing, what does the ego do? It says, okay, I'll well, attack that because you're going to age. And once upon beauty, looks, muscles was how you got admiration or respect. I'm going to beat you up with that same thing that you use as a tool to separate yourself from the rest. This makes the, the, the body the ego's best friend because the body is the ego. It's an alliance, frankly, based on separation. Because you believe you are the soul and the body is a project or is outside you or a vessel. You may not like the vessel if it's too skinny or too fat or too short or too tall or not enough hair or, you know, the eyes aren't the perfect color. And so you never really do believe you're the body until you fall completely into the vanity trap, in which case you love it, especially if you're getting adoration. Watch it. It's a beautiful way that ego captures the beautiful people. So if you side with this allegiance, you will be afraid because you are siding with an alliance of fear, of fear. So the minute, remember, right at the beginning, it, it cannot, it, the ego is not aware of the Holy Spirit. So it's aware that something's out to destroy it. And it's actually not out to destroy it because it's Holy Spirit, the true self, doesn't want to destroy the ego because there's nothing to destroy. It just, so there's no war between ego and Holy Spirit. Ego may be wanting to prevent or create defenses against Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not aware of the ego just says, return your attention to me. So when you're trapped in your mind and you wake up in the morning, and there's those thoughts or, you know, you see a wonderful couple walk past and he or she looks like your ex and the thoughts of pain and suffering and heartache come up. Stop. Don't engage. Don't go into the story. Who would you be without your story? The self. Who would you be without your adventures and telling everybody of your, your wonderful life and how fantastic you were? Who would you be without all of that? Would people not love you anymore? Would people not admire you anymore? What is there to admire but ego? What is there to love but bodies? True love is the unconditional acceptance of being, sitting presently silent with someone else without having to say anything, without ever having to impress upon them. Can we sit in total silence and not say a word and be completely comfortable in the silence? Ego cannot. It needs to impart itself. It needs to impress upon others. It needs to find allegiance, alliance. 
because it's filled with fear. And that's why you'll find in, in dogma, get together, church, community, country, attack. It's convert them to our beliefs. Why? If I convert them, then we can teach them fear and get them to think the way we do. And then we can get them to believe in a fearful God and we can impose judgment and guilt onto them and make them feel unworthy and then control them and then we can gain, make them work for us. It's the way of the world, the Western world. In the Eastern world, they do the same. They just do it so subtly that we then create caste systems and suppress people. And if we're lucky and we're born into money and, and, and family name, then we're okay. The rest are meant to be cannon fodder working there for us. And so the ego uses the body to conspire against your mind, your awareness, your mind being spirit self. Mind is just the activating agent of the essence of you, spirit. And because the ego realizes that its enemy can end them both by merely recognizing, simply by recognizing they are not a part of you, they join in the attack together. Okay. Let's read that line again. So the many me's, the enemies can end them both by recognizing they are not a part of you, your body and your ideas, ideas, identity, cluster of ideas, identity, thoughts, beliefs. Okay norms, values, identified is what you think you are. The externalization, physical body mind is what you, you think your vessel is. The two of them, ego, body mind. The essence of you is the pure, silent awareness. The silence between the notes. The silence between thoughts. The silence in your meditation. People go into meditation silence and they're waiting for something to happen. The silence is you. Be still and know I am God. You're expecting because of all the bullshit spirituality that enlightenment's going to come and it's just going to be whoa, and angels and violins and a harmonica and the harp, I see horrible instruments. And everybody's just going to be melting into like, oh, bliss. And everything's just going to be amazing. And then you're going to attract the person of your dreams into your life and the perfect house, and the perfect kids and the perfect beach and the perfect everything and put an end to world war. And if you do, how do the rest of the souls wake up? Leave the world just as it is. It's meant to be a nightmare. It's meant to be fucking hell. Why? Because this is where we come to realize what we're not. If you were to wake up and magically change the world into perfect and everybody else hadn't awoken, you take away from them the ability to awaken. The world is absolutely perfect and it's perfect imperfection. Because it's through its imperfection and all the pains and the hurts and the prejudices and the racisms and the wokenisms that's happening in this world, it'll never be equal because the desire for equality is the desire to know ourself equally in all, that the self in all of us is equally the same, equally exactly the same. God loves no one more than anyone else. And even the idea that God could is based on that nonsense in Christianity where God loves his son more than everyone else. Yet he creates the entire universe, but has one son that is favorite. But then he loves that son so much, he sends him to die. And the whole religion is based on what? The crucifixion, which is really just another analogy for our life, because we are all crucified all the time by our beliefs in the world and the judgments of our ego and everybody else's ego. And yet what is the true story as to why Christ came to this earth? It's for the ascension, through resurrection. And that's what the story is about. This is what it's meant to be focused on. So focus on your resurrection and your ascension of mind, not body. There is no body to resurrect. There is no mind to us. There's no body to ascend. The ascension is the letting go of the idolatry, the body mind. And the very essence of you, the silence in you, the holy, si the holy silent self, the Holy Spirit self returns to its rightful place which we call the awakened part of the mind or the Christ mind in which this entire universe has been imagined while it temporarily forgot that it was light, that it was the sun. But as soon as God's voice spoke into the dream, God's memory, God's Holy Spirit, a part of the sun woke up and that awake part is Christ. And that awake part is completely aligned and equal to its true self, remembers its true self as one of the sonship of God. 
And so if it's in the mind, the collective mind, it's in your mind too. And your mind is actually an incorrect term, but what is perceived as an individual localized body mind. It's in every single living, everything being it and everything. Okay. Because it's all in your dream. This is perhaps the strangest perception of all. If you consider what it really involves, the ego, which is not real. Let's remind you again. Attempt to persuade the mind, which is real, you, in other words, the mind, the minute the mind awakes, you capitalize that M, awake mind is capitalized. That the mind is the ego's learning device. What? It's true. It wants to use you and you then study. And what do you study? You study to forget. You study the ways of the world. You want to intellectualize everything. Unless you're an empath, in which case you want to run away from everything, which is no different to wanting to own everything. And further than that, the body is more real than the mind is. No one in his right mind, right-mindedness, Holy Spirit mind, could possibly believe this. And no one in his right mind does believe it. The Christ mind does not. Here then, the one answer of the Holy Spirit to all questions of the ego, the all questions the ego raises. You are a child of God, a priceless part of his kingdom with which he created as a part of him. Kingdom is a part of God. It's not God inside a kingdom. He didn't build a castle and go sit on a throne. There is no throne. There is no body in which to sit on the throne. God is not a being. God is the essence of everything. God is energy, pure energy. There's no being in that energy. And that's, again, a, non -du a dualistic religious and spiritual concept. God is a being. As you as a being, you're not a being. We use the term for being, but you are not a being. And spirit being is a fractured part of self. And so a minute he fell asleep, the, the son dreamt himself into thought forms, what we call spirit beings. But the son is not a being. The son is the kingdom, the essence, the love of God. And so you consider yourself a being, but you're not being. You are the son dreaming, and you need to take yourself from that observer, decision-maker point of view. You are the dreamer dreaming up this whole thing. And even though you've localized, you choose to change the locality of your body-mind identity and return to the source, the Christ-mind source of yourself. Nothing else exists and only this is real. You have chosen a sleep in which you've had bad dreams, naughty dreams, fanciful dreams, but dreams nevertheless. But the sleep is not real and God calls you to awake. That calling you to awake is what we call the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, the memory of him in us, in us all, in our mind. We're not learning something new. We're unlearning. We're letting go of the programming. There is nothing left of your dreams when you hear him because you will awaken. The universe is your dream. So what happens when you awaken? The universe dissolves. All body minds dissolve. The entire universe dissolves because it never existed in truth. Your dreams contain many of the ego symbols and they have confused you. Yet that was only because you were asleep and did not know. And symbols are but, you know, words are but symbols twice removed. And so watch the words that allude to something real. Okay. If it can be felt, touched, heard, smelt, it's not. If you're using your senses to know it, it's not real. It's the knowing without senses that knows. When you awake, when you wake, you will see the truth around you. You'll know the truth around you. And you will no longer believe in dreams because they will have no reality for you. You won't believe in the universe. Yet the kingdom, yet the kingdom and all that you created there will have reality for you because you are beautiful and true. And so how did you create the kingdom? Because you are a part of God. Okay, so it's not God created can put you in there. You, as a part of God, extended and created the kingdom because you are the kingdom. And yes, important, in the kingdom where you are, let's repeat that line again, in the kingdom where you are and what you are is perfect, certain, perfectly certain, okay? So in the kingdom where you are and what you are is perfect, perfectly certain. So it's know yourself. Be thyself knowingly. Know yourself with total certainty. So remember this. You are the kingdom. In the kingdom, where you are and what you are is perfectly certain. 
you are God's kingdom. It's not like God's coming into you. You are it. All of this body mind are layers that you put in front of the light to forget you because you made it in fear because you forgot. And as soon as you forgot, God spoke into his dream. And the ending of the tiny man idea began with the Big Bang 16.4 billion years ago in what appears to be space time, but has never happened in eternity. There is no doubt because the first question was never asked. Having finally been wholly answered, so never asked, in other words, it's asked an illusion. It has never been, okay? It has never been. Being alone, being alone lives in the kingdom where everything lives in God without question. So being as in the aspect of you, realizing you've never left, but you are not a being. The time spent on questioning in the dream has given way to creation and to its eternity. So the time spent on questioning in the dream. So if you were not to spend time questioning, you'd spend time in creation and in eternity. Eternity always here now, present in God's awareness. You are as certain as God because you are as true as he is. But what was once uncertain in your mind has become the ability for certainty. So we've now had to develop ability for certainty, but it was once natural to us. But because we forgot, we need to be reminded, reminded of what we are. We don't have to relearn what we are. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to travel. There's no distance between you and self and self and God. It's right here now. It's not a going somewhere. You're not on a journey as the course teaches, but on a, on a journey to a place you've never left from a place that cannot be, can, can never be, you know, through a time that doesn't exist, through a space that doesn't exist because you are that itself. The entire journey is within you and it's simply a returning to full remembrance. That's the journey. So going through your thoughts, you're returning through your thoughts and all the ideas you've made and letting go as you remember what you are. The introduction of abilities Sorry, the introduction in, of abilities into being was the beginning of uncertainty. And that's why so many a spiritual person loves the idea of specialness, because then I have special abilities. Look, I can predict the future. I can, be, I can do this and do that and tarot and heal and hands-on and Reiki and energy healing and all the nonsense. It's all you. Okay? And so don't start highlighting, because abilities have orders of difficulty. Miracles do not. Magic is illusion. Miracle is not. Because abilities are potentials, not accomplishments. When someone tells you you have potential, they're insulting you. Because if someone tells you what an, what, a, what an accomplishment, even in this dualistic world, then you've done it. When they say you have potential to accomplish something, well, you say, well, you haven't quite done it yet. Your abilities are useless in the presence of God's accomplice, uh, accomplishments. Okay? What is God's accomplishment? The creation of his sonship and, your, and also of yours. Accomplishments are results that have been achieved. When they are perfect, abilities are meaningless because you are perfection. You have no need for abilities. You just think you do while you're in a body-mind. It is curious that the perfect must now be perfected. In fact, it is impossible that you be perfected. Why? Because the perfect don't need to be perfected. You are perfect, Holy Son of God. Remember, however, that when you put yourself in an impossible situation, you believed that the impossible is possible. Body, mind, the universe. And if you don't believe it is, there it is. Look upon the world. <clears throat> Abilities must be developed before you can use them. Okay, why? Because you don't know you have them. But you have them because you are perfect. This is not true of anything that God created, but it is the kindest solution possible for what you made, okay? and you've made this body-mind, and this body-mind now acquires abilities, natural talents. Okay? In actual fact, the very essence of you, your natural talent, is the memory of God playing out through you so that you can follow your passionate nature of your natural talents, because in following your passionate nature, you are reminded of what you are in those moments of total silence when you connect and are in that zone with the, the, the source of all creation. In an impossible situation, you can, develop your, you can develop your abilities to the point that where they can get you out of it. You have a guide, capital G, on how to develop them. Be still and know I am. But you have no commander except yourself 
you therefore have no, you are, you are that which is imbued with free will. This leaves you in charge of the kingdom. You are the kingdom with both a guide to find it and the means to keep it because you are the kingdom. Okay. You have a model to follow forgiveness who will strengthen your command and never detract from it in any way. So if anything is attracting, forgive, let go, return to right minded. Be vigilant for the voice of God. In other words, no judgment. You are my holy son that is created perfect. You therefore retain the central place in your imagined enslavement, which in itself demonstrates that you are not enslaved. So you have a model to follow. And it's given you in this book. Forgiveness sets you free. No judgment, no attack thoughts. Stay vigilant only for love. Teach only love, for that is what you are. And we will teach that which we believe we are. And so teach only love so that you can remember you are love. You are an impossible situation only because you think it's possible to be in one. Because you believe this is real. Your relationships, your job, your career. You believe it's possible to be difficult. You believe it's too difficult to get a job. You believe in the difficulty and it's not difficult. It's just change your mind about it. If it's meant to be, it will be. So ask that you be shown. Why? Ask to be shown what? How do I serve? I don't ask for the job, then ask for the relationship, ask for the career, ask for the house. Ask how do I serve and all else shall be given you. Seek you first the kingdom. And since you are the kingdom, seek you first yourself, capital S self, holy self. You would be an, in an impossible situation if God showed you your perfection and proved to you that you were wrong. Why? Because your little brain would just implode. And what happens to when the entire universe disappears in front of you? You call that death from your current perspective. They don't call upon it too early because you're not ready to dissolve into the light of the awareness you are. This, will, this would demonstrate that, that the perfect are inadequate to bring themselves to the awareness of their perfection and thus side with the belief of those that have anything, anything and need help and therefore are helpless. What does that mean? It means that if God was to show you that this is an illusion, you would then hold yourself guilty for having created it. If God was to show you you were perfect, you would then hold yourself guilty for having dreamt that you weren't. And that is exactly why we're trapped in the reincarnation cycle. This is the kind of reasoning in which the ego engages. God, who knows that his creations are perfect, you are perfect. Not in your human fallibilities and your humanness, but the very essence of what you are. And so instead of judging what's wrong with your humanness, Focus only on yourself, which is true. Okay. So God who knows his creations are perfect does not affront them. This would be an impo as impossible as the ego's notion that it has affronted him and cannot because it doesn't know it. God has no idea the universe exists. He's only aware his son is dreaming and he knows his son is not having a happy dream. That is why the Holy Spirit never commands free will. To command is to assume inequality. Holy Spirit, a higher state than you, and it's all sons are equal, which the Holy Spirit demonstrates does not exist. Fidelity to premise is a law of mind, and everything God created is faithful. So fidelity, faithfulness to a premise is a law of mind. And so everything God created is faithful to his laws, meaning you can't but act in those laws because you're made with it, you're made with the very essence of what is God's law. Fidelity, loyalty, um, alignment to other laws is also possible. However, not because the laws are true, but because you made them. And this is what we've done. This is why you can't walk through a brick wall, even if you stare at goats, even if you're a man who stares at goats. Why? Because you've created these laws of the material universe and you've made them so that you could play, so they could limit your abilities and you can't just fly. Limit your abilities. Why? so that you would have to find a better way, so that you would look for a better way. Because if this world was one magic paradise and you were Superman and were the perfect lover with the perfect house and the perfect children, the perfect family, and this was just paradise and you could eat ice cream and chocolate cake all day long and you'd never get fat, it would be so amazing. You wouldn't know you're dreaming and you'd be trapped in this delusion forever. And it would just be a matter of time and you'd be tired of chocolate cake and flying around as Superman. And so, it was, it was paradise in the beginning. Adam and Eve is the concept of paradise, it was paradise in the beginning. And we got bored of that. 
we spoke to a snake. What do we speak to? We spoke to the energy of the Kundalini spiritual concept. What did we do? Fell asleep and fell into a spiral. Okay. What could be gained if God proved to you that you have thought insanely? Can God lose his own certainty? Absolutely not. I have frequently said that what you teach you are. Let's repeat that line 20 times. I have frequently said that what you teach you are. And so why do people try and impose their religious beliefs on you? Because by teaching it, they reaffirm it in them because they have uncertainty. Teacher of God, don't be that. Don't go and impose your spiritual course of miracles on everybody. Don't go and correct everybody's thoughts. When someone says something, don't jump in there and say, yes, but in non-duality, allow people where they are. Be still, be silent, be the light. When they ask, you share. And you don't tell your story, you share the knowing, and you teach them at the level they're ready for. You don't make yourself superior, make yourself magical, special, psychic. Oh, the psychics love to be special because they have nothing else. They failed at everything else. I mean, show me a psychic who's successful in, in this world of business. No, business is bad. Why? Because they failed. And they want to be empaths and hide in a caravan or get away and grow vegetables. Why? Because they failed in this world. Failed because they don't have courage. So they want to now be psychic and predict and be special. Nonsense. Stop it. Would you have God teach you that you have sinned? Do you want to know that you made this entire thing up? He won't. So what he's going to do, he's going to let you come back and realize that you've made up this entire mess and all its modalities and all its magic and all its nonsense and figure it out and be still and know. And when you call, here I am. I'm not advertising this. I'm not promoting this. I'm not selling anything. You can't pay me. I'm not promoting anything else. Read the book. Don't read the book. I get nothing to gain. How many Course of Miracle books are sold out there? I don't charge for this work. In actual fact, I pay to do this. I'm paying for airtime. I'm paying for subscription. I'm, why? I share this because I want to. If you want to attend, you attend. If you don't want to attend, you don't. If I offend you, piss off. I'm not apologizing. I owe you absolutely fuck all. And if you don't like it, leave. Because I'm not doing this for you, I'm doing it for me. Because this is the way I remember. And if you're offended by this word, then you believe words are offensive. And therefore, they're offensive in your head, in your mind. Because they're not offensive in mind. Fuck means fornicating under the consent of the king. And it's a good thing. Because 11 minutes of pleasure and 30 years of hell. It's all in your mind. Change your mind about what you are. You wouldn't need me. And I certainly don't want you to need me. I want you to rely on yourself. And I'm here as a signpost, if you so need. But if you need me to appease you, you're in the wrong school. You're in the long Zoom class. Switch off, go home, go eat ice cream. At least that way you're happy. Holy Spirit's in the ice cream too. Or smoke a cigarette. God's also in the tobacco. And fuck it, drink a Jack Daniels because God is a spirit. And those who drink spirit, remember him. But only one. And you don't need to get drunk because then you forget who you are. And if he confronted the self you made with the truth he created for you, what could you but be afraid? Would you doubt your right mind? Which is the only place where you can find the sanity he gave you because it is your true abode. It is you and total clarity and awareness, realizing this is but a silly little dream. And so while you're here, have fun. Don't make anything your God. Don't make anyone your enemy. Return your mind to silence as frequently as possible. And in that silence, give gratitude to your brothers, your creation. Don't run away from this world. You made it. Don't hide. You're not specially reclusive as a psychic empath, whatever the fuck. It's you. Love all of it. And if it offends you, it's because you're offensive. And if it doesn't offend you, it's because it's love. And be that. Teach only that. And you're not everybody's cup of tea, and that's okay because tea sucks, and people that drink tea must be sick. You know, if you drink coffee, you're definitely enlightened. The monks did it for years. Tea's bad for you. If you believe anything I say, you don't understand how to take a joke. God does not teach, and therefore, I'm not quite God yet. And no one actually will be. I love it when people say, but I am God. No, you're not. At best, you are the recognition of the sonship, which is the extension and the love of God. So anyone that claims in non-duality that I am God, dude, 
you need to see someone that gives you little pills. Maybe a Viagra with a Valium in the morning is going to help you because that way if you don't get a fuck, you won't give a fuck. But there's something really fucking wrong with your head. You are not God and never will be. Because as God creates the sonship, the sonship cannot create God. As the father extends into the son, the son shares like the father. So get out of your little spiritual high horse. You're not God and never will be. And God does not teach. Why? Because he knows you have it all. Because he's imbued it in you as he created you. He created you with the very essence, which is you. Which is the very same essence, which is him. And therefore you have it. And yeah, you're playing. And if you want to be a rude spiritual cowboy, be one. But don't try and be like me because you won't pull it off. Because this was designed in its own unique way, not special, just uniquely different in order to bring through a message in fucking Africa. Because if you're a sissy and you're harmless, you won't succeed here. So it needed a tough cowboy on a Harley Davidson, smoking cigarettes and drinking Jack Daniels and, and doing all the shit he got up to. Why? Because that way it would be authentic in Africa. Because we don't need another, I love you, spiritual teacher. The Shuao, the Indian Vedantic way won't work in Africa because, yeah, you'll get your ass kicked before you can pray. Yeah, something will eat you before you can be still and know I am. To teach is to imply a lack and you don't have a lack, which God knows is not there. God is not conflicted. And if you are wrong mind, the minute you're conflicted, do I, don't I, wrong mind. Teaching aims at change. But God created only the changeless. This is not teaching. This is not me teaching you. This is me reminding myself. And if you happen to be a spectator of me reminding myself, good for you. And if you're offended, fuck off. The separation was not a loss of perfection, but a failure in communication. A harsh and strident form of communication arose as the ego's voice, a harsh and strident form of communication. And so people that claim they heard the voice, the Holy Spirit's voice and Jesus' voice, you're talking shit. You're making it up. You have a psychosis because you can't hear Jesus' voice because there is no Jesus. Jesus dissolved. He's now the Christ, the Christ in you. So if you hear a voice, it's your own inner voice. Stop making up spiritual shit. Because it's not true. You just make yourself into a fool. It's supposed to be real, be authentic, be true to the knowing that you are that, which can never change. And everything that appears to change in you is not real. Your body that ages is not real. The body that appears to get sick is not real and has aligned with ego mind. Why? And how have you aligned with the ego mind? You beat yourself up. You had negative thoughts about you. And the minute you have a negative thought about yourself and you self-defeat us and you attack yourself, the ego says, I'll take that. And then attack some organ in your body. I know I had a brain tumor. I created it for myself. So if I can transcend this, so can you, because there was nobody more vicious, more aggressive, more tough than this character. And if this person can now use humor and it can transcend the knowing of himself and share this openly and willingly for nothing, because it is just a reminder of what I am for all of us, then you can too. And if you don't believe that, then you're in the wrong school. It could not shelter, shatter the peace of God, but it could shelter the idea of yours because there is no yours. God did not blot it out because there's nothing to blot out. God only knows his son is perfect. Because to eradicate it would be to attack it, and God cannot attack that which is not true. Being questioned, he did not question. He merely gave the answer, and his answer is your teacher, and your teacher is the memory of God in you, which we call the Holy Spirit. Not an entity, not a being, but the memory of God in your Holy Son of God, Christ, mind. Maybe you're not fully aware of it, but know now it is you returning in full awareness to yourself. Stop there and take some questions. Man, I'm having fun. Now we move to lesson, text chapter 6, 6 6.6, the lessons of the Holy Spirit. This is a short little piece, but um, incredibly powerful in the clarity that comes through in this incredible lesson. So this is, remember, this is now the lesson, the lessons that the Holy Spirit is teaching us. Like any good teacher, 
The Holy Spirit knows more than you do right now. But he teaches only to make you equal with him. So the whole purpose of, of sharing with you is to share that which is already in you because you're equal to Holy Spirit. Why? Because you are God's Holy Spirit. And so don't think that you're, I mean, yes, in the beginning, you know, because the course is a process, it's Jesus and the Holy Spirit talking to us as if it's separate entities. But the minute you objectify and see them outside you, it's duality. So the Holy Spirit's the part of you which remembers God. The Christ mind is the part of you awake in the dream. That's why Christ and the Holy Spirit are one, because Christ is awake in the dream and the Holy Spirit's the memory of God, one in you. Okay, so, so the Holy Spirit's sort of tongue in cheek saying, I remember more than you do, but actually it's because you've put all these filters of ideas and identity in the way. When you take the filters away, you'll realize you know what I know because I am you. So it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek playing with us. Okay, so, so he teaches you only to make you equal with him because you are equal with him. You are him. You had already taught yourself wrongly, having believed what was not true, the world, the illusions, you know. You did not believe in your own perfection, and still you don't. Still you think you've done things wrong in the past and you were good or you were bad or whatever the case is. You've done nothing wrong. You just dreamt you did. Just realize this. No matter what you do in your dream at night, no matter how cruel, how vicious, how murderous you were in your dream at night, when you wake up in the morning, the police isn't there to arrest you. And in the same way as above, so below. So no matter what you seem to do in this world, doesn't mean that you now go out and you can be as cruel and vicious and vindictive, break every law and hurt as many people as you want to, because it's not real. No, because you're hurting yourself. You don't steal it from yourself. You don't hurt yourself. Would God teach you that you had made a split mind when he knows your mind only is whole? Because the split part of your mind is not true. What God does not know is that his communication channels are not open to him. Okay, sorry. What God does know is that you're not listening, in other words. You're in, the son is dreaming and aware of being dreaming and unaware of God's voice fully presently conscious so that he cannot impart his joy and know that his children are wholly joyous. You are God's children. Giving his joy is an ongoing process continuously in eternity, not in time, but in eternity. So remember this time is what appears to be time space over a period of time, whereas eternity is always here now. God extended, extending outwards through not, sorry, God's extending outwards, though not his completeness, is blocked when the sonship does not communicate with him as one. And so what he wants us to do is to collectively, as one son, communicate with him. So he thought, my children sleep and must be awakened. And that's when he sent his voice into us. How can you awake children in a more kind way than by a gentle voice that will not frighten them? voice he speaks it into his son's ear symbolically he speaks it into his son's mind return to me but will merely remind them that the night is over and the light has come no matter what you have dreamt no matter what you've done in your past no matter what guilt you feel it's only by your making let it go you are innocent you are perfect you are the holy son of god you do not inform them that the nightmares that frighten them so badly are not real, okay? Because you want to believe they are. Because children believe in magic. They believe in their dreams. They believe, they, they imagine their dragons in their castles and their fairy tales. Okay, what you do though is you merely reassure them that they are safe now. You are safe. Your body may fade to gray, but the essence of you retains forever in God's mind. Then you train them. And this is what the course is doing to recognize the difference between sleeping and waking. So no matter what you do in the dream, it's not real. So they will understand they need not be afraid of dreams, afraid of nightmares. And so when bad dreams come, 
they will themselves call on the light in themselves to dispel the illusions, the nightmares. A wise teacher teaches through approach, not avoidance. You don't avoid. You make yourself approachable, but you don't go and impose your beliefs and your understanding on people that aren't ready. Religion has done that. Don't you do it again. He does not emphasize what you must avoid to escape from harm, but what you need to learn to have joy. And so do not emphasize what is wrong with someone's belief or their behavior or what they eat and drink and how they should live. Don't tell them what's wrong. Show them what's right by your own life. And when they ask you, then you, then you share. You do not impose teachers for God. There's nothing worse than a spiritual know-it-all that imposes their beliefs on everybody else all the time. And when they ask, you share. Of course, if they're not ready, they're going to think you're preaching to them. And they're going to resist it. But that's their ego. But if they ask, they're asking. And so you share. You share openly at the level they can understand. Egos are going to resist it anyway. So when you're ready to share, you share. Those that think you're lecturing or teaching, whatever, whatever, that's their egos. What you do is you share of yourself completely, but you dial it down to the level that you know that they can accept it because you won't be teaching someone that knows more than you do. Okay? They'll be learning from you anyway, but you're not teaching people that know more than you. Okay? So always seek first to understand, then be understood. Establish a level of their understanding, and then you teach them at that level and you slowly, through demonstration in your own life, show them a better way to be. Consider the fear and confusion a child would experience if he were told, do not do this because it will hurt you and make you unsafe. But rather, if you do that instead, you will escape from harm and be safe. And that's the purpose of the course, not to highlight what's wrong with you. That we leave to Luigi. He'll do that, okay, because he has fun in doing it. And then you will not be afraid. It is surely better to use only three words. Do only that. Okay. So do not do this because it'll hurt you. Just pushes people away from you. Okay. And do that instead. It will just push people away from you. So what you do is you say, do only this. And you show them by your example. The simple statement, perfectly clear, easily understood, and very easily remembered. And what does God teach us to do through his holy voice? Forgive. And set yourself free. And through forgiveness, understand that you created this lesson so that you can transcend understanding into the knowing of your being. Because nothing that you've ever done to anyone and nothing that anyone's ever done to you is real. So if you hang on to the memory of the past, listening to the past, repeating itself over and over again, you learn nothing new. And learning is simply the letting go of old ideas, letting go of the filters and remembering yourself. The Holy Spirit never itemizes errors because he does not frighten children. Now, remember that, that when you start to highlight people's problems and what's wrong with them, do this and do that, eat this and eat that, live like this, you want the best for them. Why do you want to impose your way on them? As if you know better, as if your life is perfect. Don't. Don't itemize what's wrong with people. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that to you. Don't you be teacher for God. Go and itemize what's wrong with them. Accept them as are, live by example. And if they ask, show them a better way. And remember, those who lack children are, are like children. I mean, those who lack wisdom are like children where they're in 80-year-old bodies because they lack the wisdom of understanding. And understanding needs to be transcended into knowing. And until you know, you have no wisdom. You just have knowledge, and knowledge is dangerous. Yet the Holy Spirit always answers to their calls, and his dependability makes them more certain. The Holy Spirit's an inch away from you. It's not even away. It's in you. Children do not confuse, sorry, children do confuse fantasy and reality. And they are frightened because they do not recognize the difference. Be careful that you don't force it upon them. And when we're talking children, we're talking about unconscious people, not just little children, especially not little children, because this course is not designed for little, little children. This course is designed for, for, for adults, people beyond the age of 12 at least, not, not before when they start to understand, understand space-time and an and idea of self and the illusion of self. The Holy Spirit makes no dis distinction amongst dreams. So no matter how bad you think your dream is, it's still a dream. No matter how good you think you were in your dream, it's still a dream. You haven't, it hasn't happened. That's why you can't score brownie points through sacrifice 
and, and, and charity in the dream, because it's what you give is given unto yourself. You only teach what you are. But what it does call you to do is to be conscious and give yourself lovingly, you, your self, your higher self, lovingly to all of your cells. He merely shines them away. His light is always a call to awaken whatever you have been dreaming. Nothing lasting lies in dreams. And there's a the word lies, lies in dreams. And the Holy Spirit shining with the light from God himself, because it is the light of God itself speaks only for what lasts forever in you, as you, for you, as the kingdom of God. Stop there and take some questions. Now we move on to chapter 6.7, to have, give to all. It's a, it's a very important line. Um, to have, give to all. And it's that tithing, the 10% tithing that the church talks about. Well, they made a grammatical error when they wrote that word down. It's give 10% of your timing to God. And when you give to all, it's not giving your possessions away. It's not giving the illusion away. It's giving all of the love you are to all of the love the world is. Of course, misperceived, misprojected, but it's all you love the world, your creation. The universe is your creation. As you are God's creation, so the universe, this world, the spirit world, is you, the Holy Son of God, dreaming your creation. So in order to return to full awakening, you don't return to full awakening by hating your creation, denouncing it. You flip it around and you love all of it. You accept all of it. And very often you have people doing shadow work and shadow work, and today it's a trend to do shadow work. Shadow work is really embracing your past mistakes in, through forgiveness and it brings about an understanding that brings that makes you realize I had to go through that to realize this about myself. And so through I, when I forgive, I bring I un, bring through understanding and I'm grateful for the understanding. And shadow work isn't embracing your shadow, embracing your ego. Truth can't embrace illusions. You know, you know, the only reason you have a shadow is the light's outside you. If the light was you, where's the shadow? And so to have give give all to all you give all of your authentic holy spirit son of god self openly to all and as we spoke earlier at the level that people are ready and i'm going to stand on the corner and and preach and and again this this course in miracles and helen was very strict about this and um and jesus brought this communication through jesus christ mind brought this communication don't turn this course into another cult don't turn it into another religion if you offer it, offer it freely. Don't turn A Course in Miracles into a way of earning money. Find another way to do it, but share the course openly. And of course, you can incorporate it into what you do, but don't make money out of that which is universally ours. It's, it's collectively ours. It's us reminding of ourselves. Now, yes, if you love it and you want to teach spiritual modalities, by all means do. The course is not meant to be something you're making money off. And if you are, you're putting yourself, you're going to beat yourself up. And I see that with uh, Marion Williamson. Right now, she's up in arms and doesn't know what to do. And if she doesn't know what to do, it means wrong-minded ego. The school shootings in America, which of course is a terrible atrocity. The minute you take a side and it's now fighting with gun control and Marion, teacher for God. And I hope you're listening and I hope you find this Marion Williamson. This is for you. Step above the battlefield. Nobody was killed. There's no school teaching. Not that it's not an illusion, but you're making it real. And how do you transcend this? Focus on what to do. Give light to the parents that are struggling. Bring peace to the minds of the children whose friends have died. The children who are still at the school. The parents who are struggling. Don't bring it into political, politicized gun control nonsense. Guns don't kill people. Stupid people kill people. If there weren't guns people wouldn't be able to be safe. Don't go there. At some level of illusion, they're required. Don't understand why that person killed all these children and himself, and you'll see the psychosis of the ego. Focus on that and focus on forgiveness. Let go, release. Marion Williamson, you took a course in miracles and you made a business out of it. It's now biting you in the ass. Practice forgiveness. This is what happens. Teachers for God, you take God's word 
just like the religions did. You make money out of it. That little thing with the tail and the two horns inside you is going to bite you. And it's your karma, meaning what you put out there, you receive. You're not to make money of God's word. And if you don't like that, you can go fuck yourself because I'm not playing your game and I'm not appeasing you. This work is not to be sold. I don't know how stronger I can say than that. And if you're offended, tough fucking shit. Because what's offended is your ego. Because what you hear as a voice isn't true. What's happening is your ego is being shaken because of your guilt. This word is for free. Helen didn't charge for it, didn't make a cent of it. Why should you? Find a way to make a living. Share your love passionately, but not the word of God. Not the word of the most high, your holiest of holy spirits, which is you. This is you reminding you of you. The Christ is your mind returning to you in complete, clear clarity awareness. And if you misuse it, your ego will punish you. And so to give all, you give all of yourself openly and freely. Not because you need students, not need, you don't need, this group is tiny. You give it unconditionally because to give is to remind yourself that you have because only those that have can give. When your body and your ego and your dreams are gone, the disappearance of the universe, Gary Renard, the title says it all. You will know that you will last forever because what lasts forever never dies. Perhaps you think this is accomplished through death, but nothing is accomplished through death because death is nothing. Nothing dies. And if you're saddened by death, you're saddened by the death of an idea called the body-mind. If you truly know yourself and you know the self and everybody else, when they finally lay their body to rest, you should celebrate. It don't mean you go to a funeral and act like a monkey. You don't go and, you know, blow a trumpet when people are sad. Be respectful of those egos that are where they are. But you celebrate inside because a part of you has returned to the essence of you. And if it hasn't awoken, it'll return in body for mind. But you celebrate because temporarily that aspect of yourself is now at peace in a less dual spirit world. Yet to return, to again undergo what it needs to undergo so that you can remember what it is. Everything is accomplished through life because you are life itself. And life is of the mind because you are all mind. What we call spirit and mind is one and the same thing. And in the mind. The body neither lives nor dies because it cannot contain who you are, okay? And who you are, you are life. If we shared the same mind, which if we share the same mind, you can overcome death because I did. Christ overcame death. Why? Because he realized there was no death. And as the world loves the crucifixion and still hangs it around your people's necks, why? A reminder that someone sacrificed. Then you missed the whole emphasis of the New Testament. And it's why in Christianity, they hang on to the Old Testament because it's a book of prophecies, the, the Messiah's coming. Jesus didn't want to be a Messiah for anybody, a Messiah, a savior to save the Israelites. He didn't come for that. He came to demonstrate ascension, death, resurrection, ascension, to remind you that you to ascend your consciousness that death isn't real and that we all carry a cross and that cross is called the hurts of this life. We all suffer and we don't have to be crucified again because he did and he demonstrated resurrection and ascension and therefore planted in our collective mind awareness that resurrection and ascension is not only probable, it's possible and will happen and you shall ascend this body-mind universe illusion and realize that you are pure light the light which is the kingdom, the light which is the love of God. Death is an attempt to resolve conflict by not deciding at all. And so be careful. You know, when you realize people go through a psychosis, they have massive depression, bipolarity, the egos captured them, turned their chemistry upside down. Now they get onto pills and all sorts of medication. Why?
because they're depressed, they're sad, they're depressed by the, the dichotomy of this world, by the paradoxical nightmare that it's become and that it's been since we fell asleep and dreamt the dream that cannot be. Like any impossible solution the, att the ego attempts, it will not work. That's why I need do nothing but transcend the idea of doing. And yes, of course, you'll get to a place where you'll know I am. And then the passionate nature will pour through your passionate nature, which is your talent in this world. And you'll come into this world and serve of yourself. But you're not fixing or changing the world. You're not healing anyone outside you. People that want to heal others is because they need to be healed and they don't recognize it in themselves. And they think they're healing others. You're not here to heal anyone. You're here to heal self. Because as you heal self and you ignite this separation of a body-mind, what is remaining is the true self. And that true self returns to the Christ mind and another light goes on in the temple of darkness. And as one by one, the lights go on, the entire temple is lit, the temple, which is the kingdom. And we realize we've never left God. If you think you want to fix someone, you need to be fixed first and foremost. And there's nothing worse than an unhealed healer with all their prejudices going into the world, trying to fix others. That's why I don't, because I still got work to do. It doesn't stop me from sharing this because I follow the path of jnani, wisdom, understanding. And because I have this, I share it. Because I share it, I remember I have it. By having it, I realize all of it is for all of us. And not that I have to say a single word, because when it's in my mind awareness, it's in our collective mind awareness, because my mind is a shared mind in the sonship, dreaming this entire thing. So as I gain, as I gain the understanding, it's, it's there. But trust me, I'm not realizing or learning anything new that the Christ hasn't already learned because I'm just remembering what Christ knows. God did not make the body. God did not make this planet. God did not make this universe. God has absolutely nothing to do with it. No matter how beautiful you think the rings of Saturn are or how beautiful the sunset, it isn't real. The reason you see beauty in it is because beauty is in you. You don't see with your eyes. You see with your mind. Close your eyes. You still dream perfectly with your eyes closed. You still see perfectly with your eyes closed. Why? Because you're not seeing with your eyes. Okay. And so it is because it is destructible. Even our sun has a lifespan. The universe has a lifespan. It's, it's destructible and therefore it is not of the kingdom. The body is a symbol of what you think you are. You think you're a body mind. You think you're autonomous. You think you're separated from your brother. It is clearly a separation device. Yes, you may get together for 11 minutes of pleasure and then you leave with little sticky bits. But guess what? You cannot join. Of course, you want to join in passionate lovemaking. You don't join anything. Two bodies bumping up against each other and then you have to separate again and recharge. Nobody's joined, but minds can unite. Minds can unite in illusions and my, minds can you, unite in right-mindedness, in Christ consciousness. And so you are called to choose. Do I want to buy into the illusions and the problems of the world? If you're starting to discuss and argue and this is right and that's wrong and this is good and that is bad, you're trapped in the wrong mind. Right-mindedness is not a single judgment about the world in right-mindedness. There's no should have, could have, didn't. There's no guilt, no sin, no fear. No past, no future. There's only now. And what you're called to do in vigilance is when those thoughts come of the past or the future, fear of the future or resisting what happened in the past or wishing you had in the past and you don't have it now. When the thoughts come, stop. It's what Jesus said in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, 40 days and 40 nights of prayer. It says, Satan, get it behind me. Satan, ego, get behind me. I'm not engaging. You don't try and fix the ego. You don't dissolve the ego. You don't shadow work. You stay in the light. And you extend the light outwards by sharing all of the love you are. And as you extend the light, where's the shadow? You want to get rid of shadows? Be the light. You want to see the world become loving? Teach only love. And how do you teach love? By being an example of authentic self in love, sharing all of yourself constantly, all the time, to everyone, not deciding he's worthy, she's not. They're all yourself. Not holding grudges and punishing. Look what happened. What was this that played the actor of the pirate? I forget his name. Johnny Johnny Depo, whatever his name is. So the girlfriend fucked up whatever she did, and she's psycho. Man, as the world attacked her, well, she's psycho. There's a psychosis there. 
whether she was wrong or right, doesn't matter. How about practicing forgiveness? Why are we so attacking her, also infatuated with Depp, as if Depp's never done anything wrong? So it's okay, he smoked and did drugs and whatever. Now we attack her because she did this and she lied. Tell me, throw the first stone when you've never lied. Throw the first insult and attack when you've never cheated. Never bad mouth anyone. Never said something that you regretted the next day. How about we practice forgiveness? Biden, the American president, there's the, the, the left and the right, the Republicans and the Democrats. We can see he's a puppet. We can see he's got Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or both. We can see he's lost. We know that the agenda is being played by the puppeteers. We attack him. How about forgiveness instead? See the light in him. We did the same to the previous guy. We do the same to every president. We complain, we bitch, we moan. Why don't you get off your ass and do something about it? If something bothers you so much, get up and do something. If calls from love, an act of love, but when you're complaining, you're crying for love. Now you want to be loving and you want to know God and you want to know Christ and you want to have a relationship with Jesus. And then you judge. You want to see angels, but you judge. Angels are simply misperceived representations of God, Holy Spirit, in a way that you have fantasized. When you see an angel, it's just the Holy Spirit in a way that you can see and palatable because you once saw them in a church and they look pretty with their wings like a dove. Angels don't have wings and certainly no feathers. And they're not going to make love to you when you ride your bicycle in your bath in the city of angels while you're a medical surgeon. There's no such thing. They don't fall in love with you. Angels don't fall. They never have. You fell asleep. That's it. Your body is a separation device and therefore does not exist and never has and doesn't end in what appears to be death. The Holy Spirit, as always, takes what you've made and all the things you've done wrong and all your sins, fear, and guilt and translates it into a learning device, including this body, teacher for God. Again, as always, he reinterprets what the ego uses as an argument for separation into a demonstration against it. Communion with God is how we fell asleep. We stopped the communion. We didn't separate from God. We simply stopped communing with him. Don't. Build a relationship with your Holy Spirit. Talk to it as if it's your best friend, because it is. If the mind can heal the body, and it does, and I'm a living example of it, the body cannot heal the mind. Okay. Why? Because the, the body is a projection of mind. You don't have a body with a soul inside it or a spirit inside it. You are spirit projecting your body. That's why you cannot have a demonic possession of it. You just have a lost in translation mind. It brings back a past memory, and then that appears to be a demon. Another one of those magical nonsenses. There are no demons. Demons are but thoughts, just like Satan is a thought. It's a thought of mud and darkness in the dream of light. Let it go. Then the mind must be stronger than the body, and each miracle demonstrates this, okay? because the mind is stronger than the body, because the body doesn't exist, and therefore the mind is your spirit is your ultimate superpower, if you want to call it that. I have said that the Holy Spirit is the motivation for miracles. It's also the memory, okay? So it's the reason for. He always tells you that only mind is real. Mind, spirit, same thing. Because only mind can be shared. Because God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit. Why? Because we are spirit. We are made in God's image. What part of us? the essence of God, because how did they explain image or essence 2,000 years ago when they wrote the Bible? They didn't have a word for essence. There was no such thing. And so they used image. We're not in made, this body is not made in God's image. The essence of our true self, our spirit, our soul is that which is identical in essence to God. The body is separate and therefore cannot be a part of you. Don't denounce it. Don't hate it. But don't make it your idol. To be one of one mind is meaningful, but to be of one body is meaningless and impossible. And of course, churches try and do that, the one body of blah, 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 nonsense, separation. Because show me a church that loves all churches, and I'll show you one that preaches non-duality and divine love. 
by the laws of the mind, then the body is meaningless. Don't look for meaning in meaningless places, especially not in the body. And therefore, don't look for meaning in why you did and what you did and why have they come into my space and why is this person attacking me? Don't look for meaning there. Go only to silence. Go only to right-mindedness where abide in God, in silence. Be still and know I am. To the Holy Spirit, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. This is familiar enough to you by now, but has not yet become believable. Why? Because you still believe in ranks and yourself is, you know, still trapped in fear, guilt, and sin. Therefore, you do not understand it and you cannot use it. We have too much to accomplish on behalf of the kingdom, you, to let this crucial step slip away. It is a real foundation stone of the thought system I teach and I want you to teach. You cannot perform miracles without believing that they are natural because it is, it is belief in a perfect equality. So if you see someone ill, what you don't look upon them anymore as ill, you just see them as healed and healed because we're all healed. And you say, thank you to God for showing you them healed and you offer it. And if they so choose, they will heal and they'll heal instantly. Only one equal gift can be offered to equal sons of God. And that is full appreciation. So whenever you hold a grievance, look for what it's taught you. Look at how you've gained through that grievance. Look at how you've become stronger, better, lighter, more loving because you've transcended that experience. That is why you forgive. And the minute you understand the lesson and how you've transcended it, the grievance by forgiving and letting go, realize the gratitude. And the gratitude is appreciation. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. I seek gratitude to ourselves. Show me gratitude, not because I need your gratitude, but I want you to feel the gratitude. Because when you feel gratitude, then you become filled with more to be grateful for. Nothing more and nothing less without a range of order of difficulty is meaningless. And there must be no range in what you offer to your brother because there is no range. The Holy Spirit who leads to God translates communication into being just as he ultimately translates perception into knowledge. Just let's do some for a second so we can. So the Holy Spirit who leads who leads to God, translates communication into being. So Holy Spirit's like a lead, a roadmap, the memory of how to get back home. In you, translates communication into being. So into being present here now. So you're an activity in the mind, and that is being. When you return to God, being dissolves, and the essence returns to the Christ mind as the Christ mind returns to the essence of God. Just as he ultimately translates perception into knowledge. Now remember, what you see in the world is misperceived projected. Now, what he starts to do is that misperceived projection, he changes the misperce misperceiving. The projection continues while you embody mind. But as the filter at the back of the mind changes, what do you see where you saw hatred? You see love. When you saw ugliness, you see beauty. When you saw someone that you wanted to attack or was attacking you, you see a brother. So the Holy Spirit's changing the core part of you that is misperceiving through judgment and then projects. So while you're in a body mind in this world, the projection continues. But what happens is as the interpretation changes, what you see, the meaning changes. So once you saw a mountain, now you see the Holy Son of God. Once you saw a tree, you see a projection of the Holy Son of God's beauty. Once you saw a brother that you that was evil, and now you see a brother that was just misguided and fell asleep and sin and appeared to murder, rape, or whatever he did. And then you realize he's, you just forgive. And as you forgive, you release him from it. You see the parents whose child was murdered, and you, and you don't attack the murderer. You bring forgiveness and love and light. And to the murderer, you bring forgiveness. Why? Because it's all you. Just as you've dreamt yourself up as a misperception of what you really are, so they did, and they just fell darker. That one fell deeper, and that one attacked and murdered. That one is lived with remorse. And if you don't lift them out of it, they get trapped in remorse. It's all you, and you share all of you lovingly, without judgment, without attacking. And of course, if the parent says, but the murderer doesn't deserve to be forgiven, you don't attack the parent. You just practice forgiveness with the murderer, and you lift the parent up. Be careful that you don't bring your prejudices into the world. It's difficult. Of course, I know it's difficult. You think I don't you know, struggle myself with, with some choices I need to make sometimes? Of course, 
But if I go quiet and I allow it to come to me, it becomes effortless. And that is, that is the trick of someone who was a strategist and blah, 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 and MBAs and studies and doctorates and nonsense on how to plan and secure a perfect future release. And it just comes to me now. Happens to me, happens for you. The ego uses the body for attack, for pleasure, for pride. The insanity of this perception makes it fearful one, a fearful one indeed. Why? Because if it's used for that, it can lose it. The Holy Spirit sees the body only as a means of communication. So it's a, the body is a communication device because communication is sharing and, and, and sharing it becomes communion. Now, of course, you can share the right-minded or wrong-minded, but it's designed for communication. So offer it to the Holy Spirit. Show me another way to see this and to interpret this and to share the love I am. Remember, everything is either a call for love or an act of love. Perhaps you think that fear as well as love can be communicated and therefore can be shared. Yet this is not so real as it may appear. Those who communicate fear are promoting attack and attack always breaks communication, making it impossible. So when people are, are promoting attack, what you're actually doing is you're cutting communication with the remembrance of yourself. Egos do join together in, tem in temporary allegiance, but always, sorry, egos do join together in temporary allegiance, but always for what each one can get separately, okay? The Holy Spirit communicates only what each one can give to all. He never takes anything back because he wants you to keep it because by keeping it, you have it, and then you can share it. Therefore, his teaching begins with this lesson. To have all, give to all. This is a very preliminary step and, and one you must take for yourself. I'm going to impose it on others first. It is not even necessary that you complete the step yourself, but it is necessary that you turn inwardly in that direction. Having chosen to go that way, you place yourself in charge of your journey. Vigilance, where you and only you must remain. Be vigilant for God and God's ways. The step may be, appear to exaggerate conflict, rather than, a dissolve, than dissolve it, because it is the beginning step in reversing your perception and turning it into right-sided right -sided perception, right-minded perception. Okay. This conflicts with the upside-down perception that you have not yet abandoned the belief in world of bodies and separation. Or well, the change in direction would not have been necessary. Some remain in the step for a long time experiencing very acute conflict. They want to be spiritual. They want to know God, but they want to make this world real. They want heaven to come here. They want to make this heaven like realizing you don't do this. You bring the illusion to the truth. And what happens when you bring this illusion to the light of truth, this illusion dissolves and you realize you've never left heaven, the kingdom at this point, at this point, they may vary to accept the conflict rather than take the next step towards its resolution. Having taken the, the step, however, they will be helped. Once they have chosen what, what they cannot complete alone, they are no longer alone. So realize at this point, you know, when you accept the conflict rather than take the next step, you stay in conflict. Holy Spirit, show me another way to get this. Okay. And show me another way to get this is a step towards its resolution. So the minute you've taken the first step, like I choose for God, then the second step is be vigilant. And whenever your mind goes into conflict, yes, no, right, wrong, good, bad, wrong-mindedness, trying to trap you in the good wolf, the bad wolf, the light, the darkness, the shadow, the light. You need you get all this nonsense. You need the darkness to know the light. You are light. You need the darkness to know your light. Yes, in duality, darkness reveals the light. But if you're confused that you need to integrate the two, then you don't understand light. Shine a light and show me where the shadow is. Shine a light behind an object and you see shadows. But if the object becomes the light itself, where's the shadow? Take the first step, choose right-mindedness. Holy Spirit, show me. Make a willing decision. Show me another way to see this. I choose to be loving. I choose to be the voice for God. I choose to be the loving voice for God. But first, before I open my mouth, I have to get into non-judgment doesn't mean that you won't pull people into awareness of when they're wrong. Draw upon them the righteousness that is required. I don't claim to be angelic or spiritual or righteous or perfect. Far from it. I share because I know that deep inside me I am. 
while I'm still in body mind transitioning from the belief that I am a body, the Christ mind within me, the Holy Spirit within me shares this openly because by sharing it, I remember it. Never have I ever claimed to be spiritual, enlightened, awake, or anything but someone wanting to know God and to have a deep communion and relationship with him. I share all of myself because all of myself is all there is in every single one of us. I don't try and be holy. I don't try and be something I'm not. And even this that I pretend to be in my body-mind illusion, I'm not this either. But it doesn't stop my willingness to go in that direction. And of course, some people are offended because egos are always easily offended. But if I focus on who I offend, I will never move in the right direction for myself, which is the calling of God's Holy Spirit within me in my temple to return to my father and know that I and my father are one. I appear to teach because that is how I learn. And of course, we all teach that which we most want to learn. But I make a point of never teaching something I haven't fully understood and transcended into knowing. I will never teach you something I don't physically live. If I wanted to make people happy by appeasing their egos, I would simply sell ice cream, not teach the non-duality of something called A Course in Miracles, which to me has been the miracle in my life, which has completely turned my life from a world of attack and defend to a world of Joyous, tongue in cheek, happy, loving life self. I hope that brings you into that awareness. Let's stop here and get some questions.